Ladies and gentlemen, this is Adam Kokush here at the 2018 Libertarian National Convention. I'm very excited to be talking to my good friend Ted Metz. And Ted uh, is just someone I got a lot of respect for as a libertarian activist. But we have we have a little special connection in our story uh, as, as of uh, this year uh, because I was, as you probably know, traveling to as many libertarian party state conventions, and Ted was the chair of Georgia but was in the hospital for their state convention. And I will, I'll let him give the whole backstory on that, but I'm really proud of what I was able to do there because this is a Georgia thing that for the, the Libertarian Party, they could nominate someone for governor uh, from their convention. But if they didn't and they got someone later, they would have to collect a bunch of sig signatures. But if they nominated someone at the convention, they could also change it later. They could have, they could have, uh, they could nominate someone as a as a placeholder and have a substitution later. And uh, I, nobody wanted to run. And I was I was kind of shocked. It's a vibrant state party. You got a, a lot of good people in there, and you didn't have a, a competitive, you know, gubernatorial nominating contest. You didn't even have one pre-primary serious g governor candidate. And I said, you know what? I was there as a guest. I said, you know, I'd, as, as a visitor here, if I may make a suggestion to the body, I would, I would, I would love to hear a motion to nominate Ted Metz as the placeholder gubernatorial candidate, out of out of respect for his contribution to the party, as as the uh, as someone who we would all trust to represent the party as a governor's candidate, uh, and to do the right thing should it be necessary to make a substitution. But he was so. Energized. I don't know what else to say. When he, when he got out of the hospital, that he has decided to run, and really, it is just a a perfect dovetailing uh, of all these things coming together. That now you are running for governor of Georgia with an incredibly compelling story behind it. So maybe start from the beginning of that with your cancer issues. I'm actually going to back up a little bit and say that, that we actually started recruiting governor candidates to run for the party uh, about a year before our convention. And we couldn't really find a candidate that actually wanted to step up to the plate and do all the work to actually run for governor. So, and it's also very hard to find a candidate that's not already aligned with another party or a member of another party that's a viable candidate. Because, you know, let's face it, most of, mostly in America you have a duopoly. They're either red or blue, and very few libertarians actually have the wherewithal or the political experience or the campaign experience to actually get out and run. Well, if I may, even a little deeper than that, if you want to be an effective mover and shaker and, and, and influencer in society and you buck the status quo significantly, you're never going to be able to get the resources or the experience relevant to being a governor of a state. Although when your platform is essentially do as little as possible well you don't need a lot of you don't need a lot of skills for that right uh, i actually have been on stage and said i want to be your ungovernor we have too damn many laws too many regulations let's tear them down but we'll talk about that in a second so yes i was in the hospital um to tell a story that adam i guess wants me to tell is that i i started out with a little spot on my ear i'm, I'm a navy veteran i worked in a radar lab basically as a radar technician and over the years, working on radar and other high-frequency electromagnetic radiation, I developed a skin cancer that I'd been treated for on and off for like 25 years. It finally just like took off. Um, well, it actually started getting bad about a year before the rest of the th everything happened. And we actually tried several different types of cannabis-based topical medications, which worked for quite a while actually kept it at bay actually got rid of it for a while and anyway through the course of 25 years it would go away and come back <coughs> excuse me i hope you can edit that out <laughs> all right so we're coming up on october of 2017 and i had gotten a batch of rick simpson oil that apparently hadn't been tested properly for um, pesticides or heavy metals or something but after about two weeks of using that, the cancer took off in my ear and invaded my ear and it started to metastasize to other places in my body, including my lymph nodes. So, you know, going, I went to a dermatologist first. He said, oh my God, you got to go see an oncologist. Went to an well, oncologist. Hold on. The, the, you got to say the significance of a tumor like that getting to your lymph nodes is that it's life-threatening on a whole other level, right? 
any 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 cancer once it metastasizes is life threatening indeed. So anyway, from the from from it was late late October when I when I was when I made the appointment with an oncologist. It was the first week of November when I went to see my first oncologist. He said, "Oh my God, you need to go see these other guys." So eventually, um, towards the end of November, I went to to Emory basically and got I found an oncology team that was that actually had the skill set and the resources to be able to handle what I, what was my problem was. I developed a tumor behind my ear, which is no longer there. So here's my ear, and I had developed a tumor <laughs> that actually got to be about the size of a plum, you know, bigger than a golf ball, but it also snaked through my neck into my chest cavity and affected lymph nodes and, and actually muscle and blood vessels and salivary glands and just like they took out a bunch of stuff so well you're, you're skipping the fun shower story i don't know if you want to talk about that but i couldn't forget it i <laughs> you might have to refresh my memory because you know I, there's a lot of about I've forgotten <laughs> about part of the uh, oh, oh well you know you want to see pictures you want to re I'll, right. I'll share the pictures you can add it into the video All right, well, we'll anyway this huge tumor behind my ear well, I should, I should also back up because I, I forgot part of the story. Is like as soon as I got the, um, we had a, you know, another formal biopsy. It did come back as just squamous cell carcinoma. I always knew it was squamous cell, and squamous cell carcinoma is supposed to be like the mildest form of cancer. It's not supposed to metastasize. You know, it's supposed to be easy to treat, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, after I got the diagnosis, I immediately started sourcing some some uh, enough quantity of Rick Simpson oil to treat. Um, and I'll say a few things about Rick Simpson oil is that essentially everyone who's ever tried it and actually done the protocol, which is a gram of Rick Simpson oil per day for a minimum of 60 days has, has actually had a curative effect. And that's especially true for breast cancer, lung cancer, and other kind of cancers, but apparently it doesn't work that well on squamous cell carcinoma. However, it did kill some of the cells, and the night before I went in the hospital, I went in the shower, and I was, like, showering up, and a big chunk of the tumor behind my ear sort of, like, came off as I was drying off. It was like, ugh. <laughs> oh, man, that's so gross. <laughs> and that's what finally led you to go to the hospital. No. no, no cause you were ready to go anyway, right? The, the surgery had already been scheduled, and I was, I was going in, and I was getting cleaned up because I knew I was going to have a shower for a couple of weeks because, you know, I was scheduled for three days in intensive care and ten days in bed recuperating. I'll and just sponge bath for that. Um, well, I'll tell you, they let me have a shower two days later. Uh, they kept me in intensive care. Well, I was, like, awake right after the surgery. It was, like, telling them, God damn it, get this motherfucker out of my arm. <laughs> you know, I was, like, I had I had... IVs in my feet. I had like three in one arm, two in another arm. Anyway, I, I just want to point out one feature of this operation that is is a, a little bit unusual. That it, and and obviously you can see from the side. Of, we have him sitting this way intentionally, one so he can hear me, but also so people can see this. <laughs> good hearing side. <laughs> he can't say it's his good ear. He's only got one. But that that uh, in because there was so much tissue removed. They had to take a huge chunk of muscle out of your leg and entire, skin. They, they, they took almost my entire quadricep from my left leg. And, they, and of course, this whole skin flap is from my left leg. So I'm a lot less of a man than I was before. <laughs> but they used, they used the, um, because of the tumors, the tumor displaced other tissue and, and and when they took all that stuff out and all the muscle and other stuff they took out, they had to, they didn't want to leave it just like a hole. You'll see some older men who've had neck neck surgeries for cancer, and you see like they're missing something. It looks look it looks like they've oh my god you moved, lost a chunk of your head or something. So they actually used the quadricep muscle to pack into where the tumors were removed. So that's why this is still kind of swollen and still coming down a little bit. But I know it looks a lot better than it did. Like you know, days after surgery. Anyway, and that was that was when I saw him. I got to see him when he had the, the drainage tube coming out, and and he was and, and you know what I gotta say, Ted, uh, and this is this is one of the things I said about you at the the Georgia State Convention and, and being able to to convey your spirit and pass on your message to them uh, was that 
you you have like I I've never seen a guy you have such a like a beautiful goofy smile and laugh and it did not fit <laughs> yeah because <right. laughs> yeah, part of the surgery damaged um, the facial nerve so I I couldn't like blink I couldn't close one eye it was like constantly streaming tears and and I, my face is still numb over here but at least my lips are back I like it was just had like half a face I was like. <laughs> it was kind of funny, actually. He had to explain to people, no, I, I'm crying because of a nerve thing. It has nothing to do with my state of mind. Um, and and you, you always maintained, you know, a, just a beautiful, positive attitude through all that. It was inspiring to me because, you know, when I was, like, facing different challenges as I'm usually in my life, and I hope, <laughs> at least I'm not in Ted's situation, but I hope I can smile as well as he can. Well, and by that, I mean as beautifully and enthusiastically. Well, and, and then getting back really to, uh, I guess, part, part of the Rick Simpson protocol, you know, I did continue that even <laughs> into the hospital. Um, it did, I think, help me heal rapidly. And again, they, they had me scheduled for three days in intensive care. I was out in 12 hours. They had me scheduled for 10 days in the hospital. I was out in five total. And then, anyway, throughout the whole thing, I've only taken maybe three or four oxycodones because of the pain level was so bad. And m two of them was because of the radiation burn months after the treatment. But that's another, we'll get to that in a minute too. So I never had any pain. Of course, you know, with dead nerves, I guess that, that helps too. <laughs> but I'm still recovering. I'm actually still recuperating. At six weeks after the surgery, I started the radiation, the chemo. I did eight weeks of radiation and chemo. The uh, radiation caused my hair to fall out. I looked like hell for a while. I used to have this beautiful hair. <laughs> well, I'm actually, I, I know you, you like to wear your hair in a, a kind of Thomas Jefferson style almost. I, I like you better with short hair, I gotta say. Well, you know, the marine high and tight. That's like, hoorah! <laughs> but, you know, I was a sailor, so. <laughs> Close enough. I'll, 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 I'll forgive you. Yes. <laughs> so. Now you got out of the hospital and you, you heard that you were nominated for governor and decided, well, then I'm going to. Well, I, I will back up and say that I had talked to my executive director and my vice chair and told them that if no one else wants to be nominated at the convention, please nominate me. So, you know, they were, they were, they were ready for it. What some of the people who actually wait, wait, hold on. That's, that's the first time I've heard this element because like I didn't know that when I called to nominate you they were calling for nominations and before any of them said anything I was like it's got to well, be Ted I, I actually think that I, I don't know if they were going to nominate me or not but I said if someone nominates me I will accept the nomination I told them I would you know I was originally going to run for insurance commissioner because I ran for insurance commissioner in 2016 because that's actually my lifetime career in education and certificates of training and crap you know government credentials mm -hmm. um so since we had someone st step up for that position you know governor is is as important as, as a state -wide, wide race it's actually probably the most important position that a libertarian candidate can run for within a state so i was actually very happy to hear that that, that i was nominated because that meant that i can get out and spread the message because when people hear what I had to say, they can't unhear that. So this is really a thrill for me. I think I shared with you that I was at a, at a festival in Augusta two weeks ago, and I usually start out my presentations with, you know, the essence of libertarianism is the same thing you learned in kindergarten. Leave me alone, don't tell me what to do, and don't steal my stuff. The crowd really liked that, but the organizers of the event Afterwards, I sent some pictures that I took to them, and they, they wrote back and said, thanks for coming. It was great to hear you. And all I've been hearing all week long is, leave me alone and don't steal my stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so I know that's a win. Nice. Now, th there's one other really exciting element of this gubernatorial campaign. You are about to embark upon a listening tour. As you've heard from my campaign advisor, that yes, I'm, I'm. We're gonna. We're. I can be self-deprecating, and I can like laugh at myself because I'm a goofy son of a gun sometimes. But yeah, we decided we're gonna we're gonna bill it as a listening tour. I'm gonna hit all 159 counties. Bye, Dan Johnson. <laughs> nice plug, Bye, Janie. Well, I'd like to talk about that too because you know that's kind of what. 
Dan never would have showed up at a libertarian convention had it not be been for, you know, getting them to come to our meetings and stuff like that. So it's, it's, it's a wonderful thrill. Dan Johnson spoke at the uh, Georgia State Convention uh, d about about his activism and rendering government obsolete through market solutions. It was a really beautiful presentation. Absolutely. So we're like really pleased. I'll tell another story about Jeffrey Tucker actually introducing Gary Johnson at another campaign event. But anyway, um, I kind of lost my train of thought. But running for governor and the listening to her, yeah, that's where we were, was listening to her. Um, and essentially, I'm going to travel all 159 counties in Georgia and hopefully maybe half of the 535 cities in Georgia on a listening tour. And the, and the tagline is, you know, I, I'm still going to listen twice as well as any of our, <laughs> any of the candidates who are ever going to come through here. A libertarian with one ear listens better than a Republican and a Democrat with four. Exactly. So, um, and part of my... Should, where should I go from here? It's like that's that's what I'm planning to do is, is do a listening tour, which takes campaign contributions. TedMets.com. Donate early, <laughs> donate often. Well, I was going to give you the chance to plug at the end, of course, but I, I plug enough, you know. Slowinski, 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 right? <laughs> you were there for that. Right. That's Ted T E D M E T Z dot com. Now, Ted, yes. there, hey, there you go. <laughs> All right, so. Uh, so anyway, we can talk more about um, the the nomination process. Well, I just I just want I want to ask you first, just and, and, and this, I think this is the most important thing to, to to bring this together. With this with this campaign and and with your many years of activism ahead of you now that that you're on the other side of this uh, cancer scare, uh, what what do you hope to achieve with this? Oh goodness, um, again. This is a really weird election cycle because the two Democrats that are the two Republicans that are going into a runoff on the 24th of July, essentially both have been indicted for various like wrongdoings. They're 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 not they're career politicians and they're part of the you know one of the most corrupt government state government systems in the whole nation. You know that uh, you know some people would argue that their state is more corrupt, but. The way they run Georgia is like a penal colony as it was founded in the 1600s. But what I really hope to achieve is to point out that government is obsolete. You know, I've, I've, I figured out that one of a good way to get people's attention is saying that, you know, government services are a ripoff. Do you get a refund if they don't do it right? Do they overcharge? Do they gouge? You know, do they make you wait in long lines? You know, do they, are they customer service friendly? If they were a, if, if, you know, if government was a Walmart, would you ever go to them again? Yeah, so, you know, that's, that's part of it. Um, I'm going to get out my campaign card because, you know, I've been evaluating what, what is it I can talk about that resonates with people. And there's really two messages. You know, one of the messages, I've been voting for over 40 years now in, like, presidential elections because, let's face it, I'm old. But every election, especially statewide, even federal, on the federal basis, they talk about the same talking points, immigration, education, transportation, you know, health care, civil rights, you know, justice reform. You know, now they're talking about gun control, but they've been talking about that since Reagan, really. You know, energy and the environment and veterans and blah, blah, blah. And all we get is higher taxes and more Band-Aids stacked on top of Band-Aids stacked on top of Band-Aids, and nothing really ever happens. So... Something else I've been saying for years is that if you want to know what a politician is going to do once they're in office, take their campaign promises and think the opposite. Because that's usually what happens. They usually do the opposite of what they're campaigning on. Every time, for the last 40 years of my lifetime anyway. So one of the things that I hope to point out is that as a population, we can hold our government elected officials accountable under basically pressure phone calls emails showing up at city council meetings showing up at at the capitol steps you know actually get the kind of things that grassroots activists do to get a change but overall trying to change the the mindset to make people understand that the two-party system is really a one-party system masquerading as you know team red team blue let's do a scrimmage and in the end they all want the same thing bigger government higher taxes doesn't matter who's who's the figurehead doesn't matter who really is in office 
in Georgia in particular, the, the structure of our government is, I should back up for just a second and say the thing that got me into politics in Georgia, not to mention Ron Paul and Ron Paul waking me up, which really kind of started with Ross Perot. <laughs> it goes back further than that. You know, even Reagan was like, had some, some grand ideas and, and he w admitted that, you know, the biggest problems American face is government. So anyway, I've been learning all these years, getting back to, you know, getting, getting a, a taste of, 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 a liberty mindset from Ron Paul and then actually kind of participating in government happened when our our current governor in 2011 was being kicked out of Washington on ethics charges you know dirty politician within a within two months of him getting kicked out of Washington all of a sudden he's now our governor candidate for the GOP and he wins the governor's office how that happened, nobody pays attention. That's really the problem with politics is nobody pays attention. Once, you know, they, they listen to the light news or whatever, the spin on the propaganda from the mainstream news media and the lo local coverage is, is just as bad because after all, they look at these guys as advertisers and they don't want to, they don't want to jeopardize their income stream. So they don't treat them with the same journalistic integrity that used to happen when I was a kid. Watergate was the last big breaking investigative journalist story in my lifetime, after which, shortly after which they formed the Washington Press Corps. And shortly after that, the story was homogenized, spun appropriately, and distributed to all of their outlets in the same, you know, scrubbed fashion. And if you look into it, you can see that almost everything we get out of the mainstream media these days is propaganda. And then we have the indoctrination in the public schools. Another, another issues for me is like, you know, government is not working for us. Government is working for the, for the people who pay for the politicians to pass their bills to maintain an oligarchy or maintain a monopolistic position in the market. Or the military industrial complex, you know, basically run through the bankers to get rock bottom prices on, on, on minerals and other, you know, raw materials by essentially stealing it from brown people in foreign countries, which is why we have boots on the ground in 159 of 195 countries in the UN. Anyway, so, you know, I've, I've gotten deeply involved in politics because I'm sick and tired of it. And of course I followed Ron Paul into the Republican party as a Liberty Republican and tried to do all the, you know, Liberty, Liberty, you know, here's a council article one, section eight, you shouldn't be doing this, you know, you know, the fourth amendment, you know, why, why are you doing illegal searches and seizures? Wait, are you, tr are you trying to say that the, the Republican party can't be trusted? I, I'm shocked, Ted. Well, let me say it like this is like, they never saw a law they didn't want to break <laughs> or they never wrote a law that didn't exempt them for something. You know, like the, we can talk about the health care bill, you know, the original Affordable Care Act. And that's another thing. When you, when you see a bill and you see the name of the bill, I guarantee that whatever the name of the bill is, the bill is actually doing something completely opposite. The Patriot Act? Okay, the Patriot Act is really the government tyranny oppression act. We can put you away f without actually charging with a crime, with no due process, which, you know... Another thing that, that actually I learned from Dan Johnson in studying the NDAA, because that goes back to the Patriot Act, what happens in Washington is they put like ridiculous statements and sections in a bill that really don't seem to have anything to do with the bill. Snaking it in. And then by the time they build a huge web of like all these different bills unrelated that have this language in it that when they pass the master bill, it ties it all together. And then all of a sudden, like, you know, What's the word? Uh, total, total tyranny. Total slavery. All right, Ted. Well, I'm really excited to be following this race. I really am excited for what hap what's happening with the, the Georgia Libertarian Party and, and your role in that. Because the battery's dying? Because I never got to my like, main platform is oh, right. legalized cannabis. Because that's the other thing I've been doing for the last five or six years is going to our Capitol building and actually sitting on oh, the well, I was just surprised it took you that long to mention smoking weed because we've, we've shared a few times. I'm, I am actually a medical cannabis patient. 
because all use is medical because it is curative it is palliative no one's ever died of cannabis other than being shot by the police in an illegal surgeon seizure so <coughs> excuse me georgia is an agricultural state industrial hemp can save our economy fuel food fiber etc keep kids on the farm in rural georgia and actually help pay for the infrastructure they need for transportation education health care Ladies and gentlemen, tedmets.com. Please check him out. Get on his list. Throw him some money. Any, any final thoughts, Ted? Well, Adam, it's been great sitting here with you. Uh, I appreciate your activism. I hope you keep it up because, you know, you're inspiring to me, too. I'm, I'm glad that you've been able to get out, go th you know, going through the whole country, doing the tour, and waking people up to liberty and, and the tyranny that's, that's, like, on our doorstep. So keep it up. Oh, you can saw me if you wanted to, Ted. Thank you so much. I know the same is true about you, and it's great to see you in this race. I appreciate it, Adam. Thanks so much. Thank you, brother.